Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Chen and I'm currently a project scientist at the Air Lab at CMU. So welcome to the Titan Air Slam series. Today we have Professor Derek Fox and Xiang Yunmeng joining us to talk about the, top, the topic of learning to navigate in the real world without a metric map. Uh, Dr. Derek Fox is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. He re received his PhD in 1998 from the Computer Science Department at the University of Bonn and joined the UW faculty in the fall of 2000. He currently shares his time between the University of Washington and EMEDIA, where he leads the Seattle Robotics Re Research Lab. His research in, in interests lie in robotics, artificial intelligence, and state estimation. He is the head of Ro UW Robotics and the State Estimation Lab, and recently served as the academic PI of the Intel Science and Technology Center for Pervasive Computing. He is also a fellow of AAA and HOE, recipient of the HOE RS Pioneer Award, and served as an editor for the HOE Transactions on Robotics. Xiang Yunmeng is a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Washington and the Professor Derek Fox. He, he obtained his bachelor's degree from National University of Singapore. His research interests lie in vision and robotics. In particular, uh, his research focuses on enabling robots to navigate in the real world. So next, we are looking forward to the talk. And the stage is all yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Cedar Fox. Thanks a lot for the invitation. This is a super exciting topic. Uh, as everybody, I guess, here agrees that, that kind of for a robot to be able to build to build maps, models of its environment so that it can navigate through the environment and do certain tasks. Of course, one of the, the key real problems in mobile robotics. And um, uh, I'll let Chang Yun, of course, is going to give the, the core presentation. I, talk. I just want to give a very brief kind of context here where the work kind of was inspired. Um, and the idea is, of course, that in robotics, we've been working on, on, on mapping and navigation for at least two or three decades. And uh, the focus um, by the robotics community, especially as it relates to SLAM, has actually mostly been on how can we build spatially consistent um, reconstructions of the robot's environment. Um, and uh, spatially consistent means often also in kind of a metric space so that kind of the locations, the relative locations between different entities in the world are estimated as accurately as possible. And initially um, that work has focused on using uh, ultrasound sensors and then late, later also using laser sensors, kind of how do we align them to build, for example, large scale occupancy map. And, and that led um, in the, early 2000s to some, I think, very robust indoor navigation systems, right? Where robots can really go out, explore indoor spaces and also outdoor spaces, then build maps of the environment and then use them for navigation. Um, so in some sense, from a, from a research perspective, we were close to thinking that the, the, the SLAM problem is kind of solved sufficiently well. We were able to expand this to multi-robot systems and then later when 3D lasers, of course, came up, the reconstruction was not only about like 2D occupancy maps or things like that. Then we went to uh, 3D reconstructions of environments. And at the same time, also the people coming from the robotics computer vision community, they've also been looking on um, visual SLAM aspects of this problem, uh, where the focus was still on how can we kind of accurately reconstruct environments using visual sensor data. So in this case, it was either of um, sparse features that were extracted from the data um, or also especially driven by, by Andy Davison's lab, um, really beautiful, dense 3D reconstructions, surface reconstructions of, of environments. But again, the focus has still been very much on kind of being spatially consistent and as precise as possible. Um, and then I think pretty recently, actually, with um, deep learning becoming more and more powerful, especially for uh, visual reasoning, uh, it was the, the computer vision community that actually kind of revisited or started revisiting this problem and said, um, how can we use 
uh, or perform visual navigation tasks that don't rely on accurate representations, but that are more driven by semantic representations, visual representations. Um, and especially this work initially, one could have said from coming from a SLAM perspective, us roboticists could have said that um, that work isn't really realistic because they often made some kind of unrealistic assumptions about um, that the action space of the robot is discrete, um, that the robot, that the position of the robot is known, which means there was no problem like drift and loop closure. But at the same time, I think um, that, that this research coming from that community asks some, I think, really interesting questions. For example, like, especially from a cognitive perspective, do we need accurate spatial reconstructions for robot navigation? Um, how can we do this in a more semantic, topological reasoning way? Um, and it turns out, uh, if we go back, Ben Kuypers already in the 80s or before the 80s of the last century, I must say, um, he already developed techniques um, um, on topological mapping. He called it the spatial semantic hierarchy that was very, long, very much along the line of what the vision community was looking at more recently, where the idea is a robot should represent its environment by topological graphs where the nodes in, in this environment are locally distinctive places that the robot can revisit and we recognize. And the edges in this graph are kind of driven by, let's say navigation skills so that the robot can move from one of these spatially distinctive places to another. At the time, Ben, who is a professor at the uh, University of Michigan, um, uh, we didn't really have, let's say, the kind of sensors and the algorithmic capabilities to make this work very robustly. But I think, um, again, with uh, new capabilities in deep learning and computer vision, there was a question of, can we revisit this line of work? Um, and that is very much what inspired then also Xiang Yun's research, which means, um, can we build more topological style representations of environments um, very much along the lines of Ben Kuypers and these recent vision-based approaches, um, but that are more grounded in, in real robot um, navigation skills. So the idea is really kind of, can we build visual maps, visual representations so that a robot can use them for robust navigation in large-scale environments? And I just want to point out, there's also one, of course, related line of work that I think uh, Michael Milford already gave a talk in the series here on Red Slam, which again is going in a, in a very similar direction. And with that, I'll hand over to Chang Yun and he's gonna tell you about the progress he's made in that direction. Thanks. Thanks, Dieter. Um, yeah, my name is Xiang Yun. Um, today, I'm going to give you an overview of a series of work we did recently on uh, robust and scalable visual navigation uh, without a metric map. So robots have become increasingly ubiquitous recently. Uh, we start to have home robots that can help us with uh, arranging items in the kitchen. We have agriculture robots that can monitor the crops. Um, let alone, we, we know that self-driving cars are going to revolutionize the transportation. And we also recently have this cool leg robot that are very agile that can uh, navigate on complex terrains and help with search and rescue tasks. All these different robots will share different, like have vastly different geometries and um, kinematics. They all have a common sensor, which we, I highlight here. It's usually a LiDAR or a RGBD camera because the robot needs you to use this sensor to reconstruct the environment so that it can navigate inside. So that comes to the classical approach of doing navigation, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, in, in this approach, the robot would take sensor data from typically a LiDAR scanner or a RGBD camera, and these sensors will provide the robot with, with 2D or 3D point measurement. So the robot could accumulate those points over time to build a geometry of the environment. It could be a 2D floor plan or a 3D point cloud. And given this geometry, the robot could perform localization and plan a path to get to a specified goal. And as just Dieter said, SPAM has been under development for more than uh, a decade and has been working very well. Even 20 years ago, uh, Dieter has built this, uh, this like, cool museum robot that would 
that it was able to navigate in a cluttered museum environment very robustly using noisy sensors such as sonar sensors. And recently, we have seen substantial uh, uh, advancement in visual based, uh, vision based SLAM. On the right side, I just show you the uh, ORB SLAM, which is one of the de facto standards of monocular visual SLAM. It is able to build a sparse uh, point cloud representation of the environment, which allows the robot to localize and track it itself in this uh, point cloud in real time. So you can see that uh, like different uh, SLAM system might use different sensors and build different representations, but they all place very strong emphasis on geometric consistency of the representation. And in this talk, I'm going to take an alternative view and ask the following questions. But do we need strong geometric consistency or geometry at all? And do we need to memorize all those visual and the geometric details of the environment for navigation? To motivate the answers uh, to these questions, uh, I want to show you a video of how humans navigate. And this is um, a typical drone racing competition where a human pilot would uh, control a drone to fly in a large stadium um, to just compete to see who can reach the goal first. Uh, it's unlikely that this pilot would reconstruct the entire stadium because it's so large and the, the images can look pretty blurry. So it's very hard to extract like high quality features to do this feature matching or reconstruction. More likely, this human pilot would just memorize some of the key landmarks um, uh, in this building so that it will develop muscle memories to go from one landmark to another landmark very quickly. So this, this seems to suggest that um, humans actually have incredible navigation capabilities that are not explained by the classical SLAM systems. Here, I'll just summarize uh, four properties um, for human navigation. First is we can adapt to a new environment very quickly. So we are very simple, efficient. And second, uh, we are memory efficient. We do not remember uh, most of the details in the environment. For example, we don't care about the textures on the floor or the, the light on the ceiling because they don't really um, contribute to the navigation task. And third, our spatial representation is likely non-metric uh, because um, most of us are pretty bad at estimating distances and angles. So we, we likely don't rely on that. And finally, uh, while we have a non-metric representation, we're still incredibly robust uh, when it comes to avoiding obstacles. So the question is, can we build a navigation system that enjoys these kind of properties? And recently, um, this kind of learning to visually navigate has become an uh, interest, uh, increasingly popular area, a research area recently. And the goal is that uh, we want the robot to learn to visually navigate in the world without like explicit reconstruction of the environment. And we have seen a substantial, substantial progress recently. I'm just going to list, uh, just list uh, uh, some works here, but it's not an exhaustive list. And uh, partially, this is due to the recent advancements of um, deep learning that substantially improved the robust uh, machine uh, visual reasoning capability. And also, we are benefiting from um, photorealistic simulation environments like Gibson and Habitat. And these visually realistic simulation environments allow us to train um, like neural networks uh, to potentially generalize to real-world scenes. However, despite the recent progress, uh, there's still some limitations uh, in the existing work. For example, they might assume that uh, we know the robot poses, um, that robot actions are discrete, uh, the availability of depth information or panoramic cameras. And also they usually just do short horizon uh, navigation tasks. Um, so uh, these limitations also hinder their applicability to real world scenarios. Uh, so most of um, so what we see that uh, they show that it kind of works in this kind of simulated environments, but uh, very few works actually demonstrate that it can work on a real robot. And in this talk, I'm going to show the system we built that allows a robot to navigate in the real world without building a metric map. And first, I want to uh, just give a, a formal definition of this task. And here I'm considering this goal directed navigation. The robot is given its current observation from its camera and is given a goal uh, observation. And the robot is asked to get to the goal. The system would output an action. So the action would be in the robot's uh, uh, action space. So for a car, it would be the robot's uh, velocity and the steering angle. And the robot would apply that action so to update its current observation and we'll just keep repeating this until the robot reaches the goal. So in our system, uh, we have mainly three components. 
The first component is a spatial memory via topological mapping from past experiences. And our spatial memory is sparse, so that it only remembers some of the, uh, only the necessary details of the environment. The second component is a planner. The planner would take the current observation and the goal observation and the spatial memory and plan the visual trajectory to the goal. And it's simplest to form, the visual trajectory can be just a sequence of images, but I can show you that later that we can do better than that. And then finally, we have this controller. The controller would take that visual trajectory and follow that sequence of uh, observations progressively to get to the goal. And moreover, the controller will also uh, consider robot kinematics, for example, the robot's non-holonomic motion constraints, and also it will handle obstacle avoidance. And here is the outline of this talk. I'm going to start talking about the local controller, which allows the robot to robustly reach a nearby goal. And given that local controller, I'm going to show you uh, a mapping and planning, which allows the robot to reach a distant goal. And finally, I'm going to show you introduce behaviors so that we can improve the sparsity of our spatial representation and also the robustness of the system. To begin with, I'm going to show you how we designed a local controller. The local controller um, only um, gets a robot to a nearby target. So I assume here, uh, what we assume here is that the target is visually close. And to do this, uh, we can train a neural network that takes two observations and output the mortal command. But this is uh, undesirable because different robots can have vastly different action spaces. For example, for a leg robot, it might have 12 motors and it will be very hard to predict the torques of the 12 motors from a neural network with two observations. Alternatively, we can predict an intermediate representation. Here, we use a waypoint as an intermediate representation and is analog to the sub-goal representation in the traditional navigation uh, system. Here, we can decouple the robot's action space from the actual visual reasoning part of the cellular controller. And here, we, 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 um, we call this controller the high-level part of this local controller. And we can train the high-level controller by just using this uh, sample some image target pair in simulation environment, and then just train with the predicting the, the ground truth waypoint, which we can supervise. Now, now we have this waypoint, we still need to convert that waypoint to the mortal commands. And that will be part of the, the low level controller. The low level controller also needs to handle obstacles. For example, if there's some obstacle uh, in, in the current observation, then the waypoint, if the robot just directly goes to the waypoint, it might collide with the obstacle. So low level controllers still need to provide uh, the suitable mortal commands to both avoid that obstacle and reach that waypoint. So how can we design this local controller that can do obstacle avoidance? So yeah, I'm going to talk about three strategies and uh, just how, uh, uh, how they kind of compare with each other. The first one would be uh, model predict control, where you would just uh, roll out some trajectories and see which trajectory doesn't collide with the obstacle. So you can design cost function to uh, optimize for uh, like a collision-free trajectory. However, this would require you to have a local map uh, which can be kind of a metric reconstruction of the environment, but also it can be expensive because you need to roll out multiple times. And recently, uh, people have also started using reinforcement learning for this task. So you can just let a robot collide with stuff and just do the trial and error to figure out, um, uh, to learn a policy such that it doesn't collide with any obstacle. Um, but this can be risky and sample inefficient. And finally, I'm going to talk about the approach we, produce, uh, we, uh, we use, which is leveraging a policy structure called the Riemannian motion policies to do obstacle avoidance. The Riemannian motion policy is a reactive policy. It doesn't require like a like very accurate uh, uh, geometric measurement of the environment. And it's also very fast and safe. So, so here I'm just going to give you like a brief introduction of the Riemannian motion policy and its underlying um, intuition. So here we have a robot. We can define a set of points around the robot to approximate its geometry. So here I'm just using a rectangular box to approximate the robot. And we have some points measured in the environment. So this plus point would, would be the obstacles. And we also have the goal point represented by the star. And a Riemannian motion policy would be just a model of interaction between an environment point and a point on the robot. For example, an obstacle point 
will exert a repulsive force to a point on the robot. So you can think of it as like a magnet where the obstacle and the car points will have the same pole. So you will try to repulse the, 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 the will try to add, add a repulsive force which can increase as the, as the distance decreases. Similarly, for goal point, we want the robot to get to the goal. So we want to have attractive force on the robot. So that would be like a magnet with a different pole. Moreover, the Riemannian motion policy also incorporates this Riemannian metric, which measures how the error changes in the, each direction. For example, if the robot is moving parallel to the obstacle surface, then we don't consider error to be large. However, if the robot is trying to move toward the obstacle surface, then that would be risky. So we want the, the cost to increase faster so that the robot tries to stay away from it. And this cost metric exactly uh, encodes that kind of information. So we can just define this kind of uh, interactions between each obstacle point uh, in the environment and each point on the robot. And more importantly, we can actually combine all those interactions together. For example, we can just combine the interaction between each point on the robot and all the points in the environment to have a single RMP uh, to define this interaction. So that for each robot, we just have a fixed number of interactions and we can compute the optimal control commands from those interactions in close form. Here, I also want to show you that we can incorporate kinematics into the, into the computation as well. So that if the robot has non holonomic motion constraints, we can uh, directly predict the velocity of the robot and steering angle of the robot. If you want to know more about the details, you can uh, refer to our paper. Here, I'm going to demonstrate how it works in a simulated environment. The robot is on top left and the goal is at the bottom right. The robot doesn't have a map of the environment. So what it has is just a bunch of uh, measured uh, uh, obstacle points by a simulated LiDAR scan. I'm going to play the video and you can see that the robot is able to initially will do a K-turn to back itself. And then it will curve around that big obstacle to get to the goal. And note that the entire procedure is reactive. You can see that even though it's a reactive policy, it can generate like non-trivial uh, this, this, this behavior um, on this, on this simulated, simulated environment. So what we show uh, just now is assuming that you have a LiDAR scanner, but can we do that with images? So here we can leverage neural networks to take the image that directly outputs this RMP policy. So given this RMPs, we can just uh, uh, apply this close, close, close form uh, formula to output the optimal control commands. To train this neural network, uh, we use safety in Gibson simulation environments. We generate the training trajectories using the expert RMP controller, and we use uh, Dagger for data augmentation to improve its test time uh, performance. Here is, here is a video showing how it compares with the expert and also to baseline. The expert will use uh, the a simulated LiDAR scanner. Uh, so that would be the give you the ground truth um, um, reminding motion policies, and then we use that to, to drive the robot. Um, for our model, we would predict that those RMPs from the first person view camera images. And for the two baselines, the first baseline will try to predict the LiDAR scan from the image and use that predict LiDAR scan to compute the RMPs and then um, com compute the control command. The predicting control baseline would directly predict the control command of the robot from the first person view images. Now I'm going to play these videos and you can see that our model predicts RMPs actually resembles the expert the most. Uh, it's also the most efficient. It can get to the goal the fastest. If you look at the predicting depth baseline, it still gets to the goal, but uh, it's slower because the, the predicted uh, laser points can be pretty noisy. And finally, if you look at the predict control, it kind of gets stuck at this K-turn, which shows that it has some generalization issues. Here, I would like to show you that the models we trained in simulation can generalize to real world environments. So here, the robot is on the left side of this hallway and I want the, the robot to get to the goal. And note that the robot doesn't have the map of the environment. 
uh, what it sees is just this per first person view camera image. Here, there's a static obstacle and the robot tries to avoid that first. And after that, I just throw another obstacle to block its path. And you can see that the robot is able to avoid that obstacle reactively and get to the goal. So that will be part of the low, that will be the low level controller. Now we can con connect this high level controller and the low level controller so that the robot could just take two observations and then output control commands that can reach the target while avoiding obstacles. To show how it works in simulation, here um, I'm just going to show you an example. We put a target at the, the, the target image is at this green dot, and the robot is here. The robot is predicted waypoint, which is showing this purple dot. Uh, if I just play this video, you can see that um, the predicted waypoints uh, can be noisy, but the lower controller actually produces smooth trajectories uh, to get to the target. And moreover, you can see that it actually avoids that obstacle on the left side of the vehicle. So that will be part of the that will be the local controller, which allows the robot to reach a nearby target very robustly. And now I'm going to talk about mapping and planning, which allows the robot to reach a distant goal. In order to do this, imagine that we want the robot to reach a target image that's very far away. Um, so one one thing we can do is we can just provide all those intermediate observations, um, connect the robot's current observation and the goal observation, so that the robot could just use its local controller to to reach this target image sequentially to get to the goal. But the one problem with this approach is that this trajectory can be very dense, right? It's, it's wasteful because you might store some unnecessary images in this trajectory. Ideally, we want to have a sparsified trajectory to only remember those key images that are absolutely necessary for the local controller to reach the goal. But the question is, how can we know that which image we should keep and which image we, we can discard? So the key insight here is uh, which image to keep in this visual trajectory would depend on the capability of the controller. So how can we measure uh, the capability of the controller? Um, again, we can actually use a neural network to do that. So on the left side, we have this local controller I just um, uh, talked about before. And uh, we just need additional component called the reachability estimator. And the reachability estimator would take the same kind of observation target ob um, pairs but it, reaches, it, re, it pre predicts the probability the robot can success, successfully reach the target given the current observation. To train this reachability estimator, we would just sample a large number of uh, locations in the environment, which is to place a robot in that location, and we will sample a target um, anywhere in front of the robot or below, uh, um, behind the robot, and just see if the controller can reach the target. So we can generate a large number of this observation target pairs and the binary outcome. And then we can just train using like a standard across entropy loss. And the robot is able to predict the probability that you can, whether you can reach the target or not. Given that train reachability estimator, we can use it to sparsify a dense trajectory. We do it in a simple greedy fashion. So we keep the first image and we'll evaluate its reachability between the first image and the next image. If the reachability is high enough, like above a very high threshold, like 0 0.99, we discard the next image and, and get to the third image. So we just keep doing this until the reachability score is lower than a certain value. And here we just set the threshold to 0 0.99. And we just keep doing this and we can have a sparsified trajectory. And here is the animation of how it works uh, for our trajectory in a simulation environment. So you can see that as the robot is moving, uh, it constantly measures its reachability score with the previous keyframe, which is uh, represented by uh, a blue dot. So if the reachability is high, you will discard the current image. If the reachability is lower than a certain value, you will keep the current image as a keyframe and just repeat this process. You can see here is that the distribution of those uh, anchor images or the keyframes uh, kind of adapt to the, 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 the geometry of the the trajectory and also the appearance of the environment. For example, when the robot is turning, then the appearance will change faster. So we'll try to keep more anchor images. However, if the robot is just driving a straight hallway, then the appearance changes slower 
so it can space out the keyframe more. So given those, um, like, suppose that the robot doesn't have just a single uh, trajectory navigating in the, in, the, in, a, in the environment, we can collect the multiple uh, experiences of dense trajectories. And then we can sparsify all those trajectories using the reachability estimator uh, just shown here. And then we can um, um, keep the reachability score between like uh, adjacent connected images. And then we can connect these trajectories together using the same reachability estimator um, so that we can build this sparse topological map. And this sparse topological map uh, is a directed graph where the vertices are those capped keyframes, anchor images, and the edges will encode the reachability between two, uh, two vertices in this map. And here is how it looks um, um, in the simulation environment. We just keep adding these trajectories. And if the trajectories overlap, we can reuse overlapping part, and we just keep adding them until uh, we cover the entire environment. On the right side, you can see that as we add more and more trajectories, most of more and more trajectories can be reused. So the size of the topological map actually plateaus, which shows that we actually can have, have a pretty uh, efficient representation of the environment. Now, given this built topological map, we can perform navigation tasks uh, to a specified goal. To do this, we would connect some additional edges between the current observation to the vertices in the topological map and from the vertex to the topological map to the goal. We also have the reachability scores and, uh, estimated between uh, this, this observation and the, the map and the map and the goal. Now we can perform a shortest path finding algorithm to find the path with the highest reachability score. Um, we can just use the, the, the Dijkstra algorithm, um, but we can perform in log space. So essentially we take the log of the probability and we just sum them together and find which one gives me the highest reachability score. And this is inspired by this prob probabilistic roadmap techniques. And given that planned path, we can just use the local controller to follow that path sequentially to get to the goal. For example, you can see that robot started initially on the right side, you want to get to the goal. The planner will try to find the path with the highest confidence, and the robot will just follow that sequence of images along the path um, and get, get, get to the goal. So one question you might have is, what if the robot mislocalized itself? That can happen in the environment with strong symmetry. For example, here the robot initially on the on the uh, top hallway, but it thinks that it's on the hallway on the right side. So th when this happens, uh, it's actually the robot will just uh, just try to keep uh, following that uh, wrong path, but eventually it will you will find discrepancies like here. You find the discrepancies between the current observation and the next target image it's tried to reach uh, due to the low reachability score. And when it happens, you will trigger a replanning procedure so that it will try to find a new path. And here, the new path will be the correct path so the robot can just follow it to get to the goal. We perform both simulation and real uh, world in, in experiments using our model. So our model is trained in 12 simu uh, simulation environments. And in the five test holdout environments, we can achieve uh, higher than 90% success rates. On the right side, we also show your visualization of a real environment and how the topological map looks like. And here is an example execution of a planning and, uh, um, um, and, and following um, task. And here you can see that the goal is on the left side and robot is able to plan the path to get to the goal. And here, the model is trained in simulation. We don't, well, we didn't do any fine tuning, uh, but still you can see that you can generate a pretty uh, robust uh, um, waypoints and this uh, trajectory following behaviors. Here is another example where we put the robot in a much larger environment. Here, the robot is trying to reach a point on the top left, uh, which is more than 100 meters away. Another aspect of this environment is that it has strong symmetry. So the robot actually initially mislocalized itself. It's 
you think that at the end of this hallway, but actually it's at the start of the hallway. But again, as I said, the robot keeps trying to match the target image, but it fails, it tries to back it up, uh, try to back up and just try it again. So it keeps doing this until it reaches the end of that, uh, that hallway. So once it reaches there, it's able to correctly localize itself and it will just follow that path um, smoothly to get to the goal. And here I'm just speed up the video. Um, So that's the system we built that allowed the robot to map the entire environment, build this topological representation and plan a path to get to a distant goal. And finally, I want to talk about how we can learn navigation behaviors to improve the sparsity of the representation and the robustness of the system. So here the limitation of the previous system is that if we, the robot needs to get to the next target image, that, that would uh, actually imply that there should be sufficient visual overlap between this uh, previous observation and the next observation, because otherwise the, visual, the local controller has no clue how it reached the target. And that actually can limit the sparsity of um, the representation. So can we go beyond just matching the images? The key idea here is that we can just learn a low dimensional embedding to represent a long sequence. For example, um, we can have a demonstration where the robot starts from one location and reach the, uh, uh, the goal location. So instead of keeping those intermediate images, we can just encode the entire sequence into a low dimensional behavior embedding Z. Um, intuitive, intuitively, you can interpret this Z will encode high level navigation behaviors. For example, you can just say, you can encode go towards Northeast by about five meters and then turn right to follow the hallway to the end. And because we can encode such um, uh, navigation instructions, you can discard all of the intermediate images, but still the robot is able to reliably get to the goal. So how can we learn this embeddings? Well, we just can learn it in an end-to-end -end fashion. Here I'm going to show you how we encode the, the, the demonstration into a low dimensional embedding. So let's say we give the demonstration to the robot, um, a sequence of uh, color images, O1 to OT. We feed each pair of images to a convolutional neural network followed by a long short-term memory. The long short-term memory will encode the behaviors uh, up to the current timestamp. So we'll output that embedding Z1 and keep repeating this until we consume the entire demonstration trajectory and encode the entire trajectory into embedding Zt minus one. During execution time, the waypoint generator would take that Z10 minus one as the current demonstration embedding and also the row embedding Z1 prime and also some attractor features. It will take these three elements as input and also output the current waypoint and the program. The waypoint would be analog uh, analogous to the previous system where it would be fed to the low level controller to move the robot. The progress is the indicator of how much progress the robot has made. When the progress reaches one, we know that the robot has reached the, the goal. Again, the waypoint generator is a recurrent network and we just keep doing this rollout until the progress value uh, equals to one so we know that the robot reaches the target. To show how it works, here I'm going to show you an example. So here, the blue trajectory is the initial demonstration. We extract the behavior embedding from this demonstration and condition on, uh, 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 use that as a condition to the current robot uh, execution. The robot actually is initially placed at a different location as a demonstration. But still our controller is able to generate close loop behavior to get the robot back on track and get to the goal successfully. One interesting thing we noticed that even though we don't train our model with obstacles, it actually can avoid obstacles pretty well. So you can see that here, I just put an obstacle on the, uh, to block the, actual, the path uh, in the original demonstration, but the robot is still able to generate uh, this closed loop behavior uh, to successfully reach the goal and get back on track.
the embeddings I showed you before can encode a trajectory up to a certain length. If we want the robot to get to a, a goal that's very far away, then a single embedding won't be sufficient. In order to get to an arbitrarily distant goal, we can chop that trajectory into segments and encode each segment uh, separately. Then the robot will just execute the embeddings at, um, sequentially to get to the goal. So here you can see that a robot is just execute the first uh, segment. And once it, it determines to reach the, the end of that segment, it will reset itself and uh, switch and execute the next behavior. And you just keep doing this until you reach the, the final uh, the, the, the behavior and then the goal. And here's another example where we show that we can actually get the robot to get navigate to a very uh, distant location. We did some quantitative results to compare our method with existing learning based methods and also a SLAM. We can substantially outperform those learning based methods. Uh, we can be, uh, have higher success rate and order of magnitude more memory efficient. When we compare with SLAM, we also are order of magnitude more efficient when it comes to memory uh, usage. But also we notice that uh, SLAM tends to break down if your image resolution is, becomes, um, is, lower, uh, is low. And this can happen, uh, let's say, if you have a blurry, uh, blurred images, uh, which is kind of equivalent to you have a lower resolution images. Uh, but however, for our method, uh, we can operate at 64 by 64 images, but still achieves like much higher success rate where SLAM totally breaks down. So similar to the system we built before, we can do topological mapping using these learned behaviors. So uh, on the left side, you can see without behaviors, we will just connect the images with these reachability scores. However, with behaviors, we can connect these images with these embeddings. And because these embeddings can encode long horizon navigation trajectories, uh, this, this topological map can, can be much sparser. So if you see that the comparison, uh, you can see on the left side is the topological map uh, without behaviors. You can see there are like much denser uh, points uh, in, the, in, the, in the map. On the right side, with behavior, you can see the number of vertices is actually much more spaced out. We conducted quantitative uh, evaluations on five testing environments shown here, and I also visualized um, this uh, distribution of the vertices in these topological maps. And we can get a higher than 90% success rate in navigating in this uh, unseen environment. To show that the model training simulation also works in the real world, we choose four location in a real environment, and then we just uh, collect, uh, drive the robot and con uh, collect demonstrations between uh, each pair of, uh, of uh, locations. And then we can just do the planning uh, control to, uh, to, to, to plan the trajectory, which just consists of sequence of behaviors, and robot will just execute that sequence of behaviors uh, to get to a specific goal. And on the left side, you can see uh, the number of segments uh, returned by the planner and the progress of how uh, the, the current progress of the robot re, uh, following each spe specific segment. Here's another example, but we put obstacles along the path. So you can see here that the local controller can avoid the obstacle, but also the learned embeddings and the controllers can get the robot back on track. So that will be the last part of this, um, um, uh, this talk where I show you that how we can incorporate behaviors to improve the sparsity and robustness of the system. Now, go back to the questions I asked at the beginning. beginning. Can we build a, a navigation system that uh, navigate like humans? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, we just present a system that enjoys some of the uh, desir pro desirable properties of human-like navigation. First, it is sample efficient. Uh, it can generalize to new environments with just one shot um, traversal in this environment. It is memory efficient. It utilizes this reachability score and behavior embeddings to only keep necessary observations in the environment. It is non-metric because we build this topological representation that does not require a strong geometric consistency. 
Uh, and finally, our system is robust because its local controller can avoid obstacles, and we have these embeddings that are able to generate closed-loop control behaviors. Now I want to share, you some, uh, share with you some of the key takeaways uh, uh, when we did this series of works. The first is that uh, the neural network models trained in realistic and diverse simulation environments can generalize pretty well to real-world scenarios, even without fine-tuning. And if we have good experts like RMD controller and fast simulators, we can overcome the issues of overfitting because we can generate a large number of uh, demonstrations and we can close the same to real gap significantly. And finally, a modular approach with good intermediate representations can improve data efficiency and generalization. In the future, we want to go beyond indoor navigation. Uh, for example, can we have robot navigate on complex, uneven terrains uh, with complex kinematics? And moreover, we don't want the robot to just navigate around, but also we want it to interact with the environment. This will be a typical mobile manipulation task, but can we do this uh, again without a metric reconstruction of the environment? And these are the interesting research directions that we're currently pursuing. So that's the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for being here and also appreciate you uh, took your time to listen to my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Xiang and Professor Dirt. This is a very interesting talk. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, for, the, for your planning algorithm. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that uh, you, are, you mentioned uh, Example that using a magnetic force to drive a robot to a target location. But uh, what I know is that the magnetic forces methods often produce many local minimum so that the robots will not be able to escape from that point. So will your neural network also have the similar issues and how do you solve that? And what is your failure case for your planning algorithm? Um, are you talking about the, the local controller or the uh, uh, the past planning and yeah, the past planning. Yeah. yeah, the past planner doesn't have this local minimum because it just tried to find a, a path connecting the current observation and the goal. Um, so could you like elaborate what kind of local minimum are you talking about here? Um, the local minimum, I, I mean, uh, for example, the magnetic forces. Uh, oh, you're talking about the local controller, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, the local controller can have local minimum, right? If the goal is too far away and you have some non-convex obstacles blocking the path, then the robot can get into a local minimum. That can happen. So uh, I think here the local controller is just trying to drive the robot to a nearby target. So we assume that the target is reasonably close. So uh, this local minimum is not a problem. So if there is a local minimum, then I think we should break, we, we, that target means that, that not, that's not a good target, then you should get a target that might be close to the, closer to the robot um, so that um, um, the, the, the robot won't get stuck. But in practice, there, there will be a situation the real robot can get stuck uh, due to some strange geometry of the environment. Okay, so and what is the most uh, occurred failure case for your algorithm, the local controller? Um, I think that would be one of the typical failure cases. I think another thing about this RMP controller is, is that it will require very careful tuning, right? You need to tune the parameters very carefully so that it, it behaves in the way that is um, like it generates a desirable behavior. Uh, if you don't tune the, uh, the controller um, well, then it might actually get too aggressive. Right? It might collide with obstacles or it might do get too conservative. So if, for example, if there are very narrow passages, then the controller might get stuck because it's just too conservative. So I think a tricky thing is how can you uh, design the controller so that it can like adapt to different kinds of scenarios? Uh, I think that would be an interesting uh, research question so that, we, um, that, can be answered, that we can answer. So here, uh, I'm thinking that the robot can actually dynamically they change its parameters based on the, uh, the current environment. For example, uh, you try to get narrow passages, then you can maybe use more um, aggressive um, uh, uh, parameters, right? Because you need to get through that. If it's just get into some open spaces, then you can be um, um, it can be a little bit more conservative. So this, so this is what I'm 
I think. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I find there are also a lot of questions on the meeting puzzle uh, chat. Uh, the first question mm -hmm. is, uh, the sparse graph map with anchor images is associated with the mapping robot's motion capability. So can map be used by a new robot different than the mapping robot? How to improve the usability of the topological map across different types of robots? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so currently the topological map will be um, specific to a typical robot because that would depend on the controller of the robot. So if you have a different robot with a different um, uh, controller, then that topological map might not be might no longer be applicable. So one thing you can do is that we can just store a very dense topological map beforehand, and then we can um, sparsify it based on a specific robot. Right. Based on specific robot controller, I can generate the, like a sparsified map and just for that robot. And I think that would be one uh, one way to solve this problem. Okay. And uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question is: What will happen if the environment has dynamic objects, or the environment changes appearance, like a warehouse where things mm -hmm. keep changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, I, I think right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to store only the the a sparse set of images in, like in, in an environment. So it actually already does better than you store dense observations where it's more prone to this issue with dynamic environment. But still, even we store a sparse set of images, these images might still be subject to change. Right? Might still, appearance might still change. I think an interesting thing we can think about is. Um, can we actually identify static structures in these images? I think this could be uh, pretty useful because if we think that there's, ob there's an object that might get moved, we can actually exclude it in the visual representation uh, so that uh, our spatial representation is more robust to this kind of uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic scenes. So we take one step further where we can store a sparse set of images which can be more robust to this kind of dynamic environment, but I still think that uh, to make it even more robust, well, we should uh, maybe extract more uh, like um, static features uh, in the images and ignore those dynamic uh, objects. Uh, I hope that uh, answers um, the question. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. The next question is, how to automatically divide a long trajectory into segments in order to use the behaviors? Mm. So currently, um, what we do is a very simple uh, heuristics. We just uh, chop the trajectory uh, with equal um, um, with equal length, right? We set a specific uh, length so that after that length, we just chop it. Um, so there's some advantage of, so we find that it works uh, well enough. We also experimented with um, actually um, adaptively chop the, the, tra the trajectory. For example, we can train the same reachability estimator, but on that behaviors and the robot could have a confidence measure of how confident it is to, uh, um, to, to follow this behavior and we can actually, so for example, for straight hallway, we actually can uh, make the trajectory pretty long, right? Because it's a simple, uh, it's a simple um, task, but when the robot gets into some narrow spaces and try to generate like pretty uh, weekly trajectory, then we want to keep it maybe short. But in practice, we find that it doesn't really bring uh, a significant advantage. So one just keep the system simple and just chop the trajectory with equal length. Now, the problem with that is when you do the mapping, then you can no longer guarantee that um, there will be uh, trajectory can the 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 keyframes can in, can overlap each other because we get much sparser this kind of trajectory, and there we just apply a simple heuristic where we measure how much uncertainty the robot has at each location. If we find that it has high uncertainty, meaning that it might be likely at an intersection, we'll keep that image. So there's some details uh, in the paper that you can see how we uh, segmented the trajectories, uh, but we do believe that uh, we can actually do better. Maybe we can actually make use of more semantic information. For example, we can, if we can detect uh, like intersection doorways, this kind of semantic uh, um, locations, then we can just keep a keyframe there and discard the, the observations that don't have much semantic meaning. Um, okay, I, th mm -hmm. uh, I think that makes sense. Uh, how, uh, Next question is, as far as I understood, the neural RMP only uses the image as input to determine the force. How can the robot drive backwards without hitting stuff? Is there like mm -hmm. an implicit priori embedded in the RMP? Right, so, there's, so 
Yeah, that's a good good question. Uh, currently, because the robot doesn't see things in the uh, at its back, so if if you try to drive backwards, then you might collide with obstacles. That, that can happen. So there are, there's one thing we can do, uh, which is to uh, have some memory in the neural RMP. For example, currently you just use a single image as input, so it will forget what you observed in the past. So one obvious attention we can do is we can incorporate some short-term memory in the, in the controller, so you can still memorize what you have seen in the past in order to, um, to be more robust to that. And of course, there's also a, like a, maybe a simpler solution, which is you just uh, expand the field of view of the camera. Uh, like you can put a camera that points backward, but I think uh, if we just want to have a forward camera, then incorporating this memory will be a solution to this problem. Okay, thank you. And uh, next is how much time and effort is needed to train each component in the system? Is there one part that is significantly easier or harder than the others? Um, I think the system does not require uh, uh, much tuning, except for the current local controller, which uh, the expert RMP control does require some tuning. Uh, but after that, like learning the reachability estimator does not require much tuning. Basically, we just collect some uh, examples and train the classifier. Um, and uh, there, there are some threshold we need to set. For example, how confident the robot is uh, when when uh, when 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 decides to specify a trajectory, and this has to be tuned. But um, I think the tuning is not that hard because the, those values are pretty imper interpretable. Right? It's just the probability threshold that, that you need to set. Uh, you can have a validation set, and you just set the threshold and see um, uh, whether the robot can successfully reach a target. Um, so. Uh, my impression that it, it doesn't require a lot of tuning. It actually doesn't have uh, many tuning parameters. And for those existing tuning parameters, uh, they are basically just probabilistic threshold where you can tune to adjust the aggressiveness, the aggressiveness of, uh, of the system. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, I have next question. Uh, in the current setting of Mac, what is an obstacle to the trained neural network? Uh, what's an obstacle for the trained neural network? Um, so I'm not sure if I understand the question uh, correctly or not. So when we train this um, this local controller, we'll just deploy the, the robot in the simulation environment. And then we have a simulated LiDAR scanner put on the robot. So the simulated LiDAR scanner will return a bunch of LiDAR points that are measured uh, in the simulated environment. And we'll compute the the, 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 the ground truth RMPs, and then we use that as a supervision to train the neural network. So the obstacle would be just anything that where there's a lighter hit in the environment. Right? It could be just walls, it could be um, any objects in the environment. So they will be um, all considered as obstacles. Okay, uh, the next is, is it possible to perform exploration in unknown environments? I see. So here, um, I think it's possible, uh, but in this uh, work, we are mainly focus, focusing on building this, uh, this spatial memory so that robot can, can like memorize the environment so that it can just do navigation inside. So we, don't, uh, uh, we don't care about like how exactly the robot collects these demonstrations. For example, it can do self-exploration to collect demonstrations. It could be just like a, a human, uh, uh, it can through it can be collect through language instructions. It can be also through like just uh, the human tele operating the robot. So all those um, experiences can be used to build this spatial memory. And the exploration will be just one of them. Um, there are some there, there are some existing works that that do this topological uh, exploration, which you can um, if you are interested, you can take a look. Uh, so basically, we can we can use a similar kind of frontier based exploration as in classical stuff where I, have, I can have a topological map. And if I am at the frontier of the topological map, I could choose maybe to sample a direction that I haven't been before. And then I would just gradually uh, increase uh, the, the, this topological map by adding new vertices and edges. And I think that would be one way to do this exploration. Okay, um, we have last two questions. Uh, the first one is related to transferring to another robot. How sensible is the system to different viewpoints in terms of controller and localization? Um, I think the there are a few things that have be we have to be uh, careful about. So one is 
uh, the camera parameters, right? Because we are just reasoning in the image space. So if your cap, if your new robot has a different camera, then you might not generalize as well. Uh, like you have a different field of view, different, uh, if the camera is put on different height, that might affect the performance like a localization or this kind of learning. And that's also typical, like in, in computer vision, we know that um, if, there, if there's a distribution gap between like um, your training and test distribution, there, there, there's no guarantee like how much uh, you can get in the test distribution. Um, another thing is um, for the, in terms of the kinematic of the robot, it's, I think it's less of a concern because um, except for the low level, the local, the low level part of the local controller, everything is actually uh, is reasoning uh, independent of the robot's uh, kinematics. So that part can be potentially reusable if we can control uh, like the camera parameters to be similar. Um, for the local controller, it will be robot dependent, and you have to design this so that it will produce uh, the the suitable actions for that particular robot. Um, I, I hope that uh, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and the last question is, are there any plans to exploit the newest approach from NVIDIA, uh, such as geometry fabrics in the navigation domain? Yeah, I think the geometry fabrics uh, are, are awesome. I think it can it resolve some of the issues in the vanilla RMP framework. I think it will be um, interesting to see that can we apply the geometric fabric to like, improve the, the performance of the local controller and also maybe use it um, in behavior learning, et cetera. I think that would be an interesting uh, direction. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for your impressive talk. Yeah, I think we'll, um, not right now time is up. I think we can stop here. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.